Welcome to Full Stack Business Owner. Today, we're actually answering questions from you, listeners, the audience. And if you want your question answered, there are actually two ways to submit them through to us. First one is just reply to Charlie's email. Just hit the reply button, type in your question and ask away. Funnily enough, Charlie actually gets some very interesting questions that aren't actually business or investment related. So just ask him anything. It's great. I love it. I enjoy it. I enjoy it a lot. Keep sending them in. I uh, (laughs) really actually like hearing from the community. I do. But those spicy, interesting ones I get. Do you know you can get a call girl from Russia cheap these days? (laughs) You were telling me about the Prince of Nigeria or something like that. <laughs> yeah. And the second way is head over to the Facebook group, which is called Full Stack Business Owner Community. Message us over there and we're more than happy to pick up your questions here. But before we get started, let's cue the disclaimer. Charlie here from Full Stack Business Owner. I need to let you know that Grant, myself and the Full Stack Business Owner team are in no way, shape or form qualified to give you financial advice or pick investment products. We highly encourage you seek out and engage the use of professionals when making financial decisions or comparing investment products. All right, Charlie, keeping with the theme of the intro, I'm just going to uh, I'm just going to ask you a pointed question. Why? Because I can. <laughs> Is your current network holding you back, Charlie? Do you know, my mother used to say to me, if you don't have anything nice to say, you should just not say anything at all. And I feel like this is that moment when I should just uh, calm down. No, no, no. No. I absolutely don't. I'm clearly joking. Clearly joking here. I will say right now, when I look and evaluate the quality of my network, I'm thrilled with the people I have around me. I feel uh, really good that I have a combination of peers, so people doing the same stuff as me that we're learning from at the same level and sh- sharing that like live feedback. Mm-hmm. And then also I've got people who are well and truly ahead of me who are kind of like lighting that path, right? They've kind of forged it and as I get stuck or as I'm kind of looking towards things, I've got people I can go to who can help give clarity to things. Like I'll ask you the question, Grant, how many times has something seemed logical, right? You, you're in business and you're looking at it and go, this is clearly the direction to go. And then you start taking that path and then you learn something, you know, 50% into is like, oh, didn't see that coming. Yeah. Or there was that one piece of information that I'm like, if I knew that back at the start, I just wouldn't have taken that path. <laughs> yeah. So the value of having a great network is if you've got people who are ahead of that point, they can go, hey, by the way, when you get over that hill, Uh, there's actually a a massive cliff that you're not going to be ready for. And I just think that's more emphasizing the power of a network and having a really good and high quality one. But I'd ask you, like, when you look towards your current network, are you happy with the quality of it? Yeah, so I look at my current network as exactly that. So I can literally pose any question that I've got to the extent that most of my network uh, are not a bunch of yes people you know what, they'll call me out. They'll tell me when I'm doing something silly, but they're actually so open and transparent on what they're doing, what they've done, what has worked, what hasn't worked. It's actually really helping me as, based on where I'm at in my business journey now, but also based on where I'm going to the point that you were mentioning, which I will tell a story. Like I wasn't always like that. Like this is something that I learned from having it the wrong way. Right. So when I started business, it was like through university. So sort of I was connected to everyone at university. I'd go and build business networks based on sort of meetups and things like that that I went to. However, everyone was like a really closed book. So I would ask them like, okay, well, what are you doing? How are you going about business? How are you generating leads? Like this is what I'm doing or sharing processes and all that kind of stuff. But I felt like it wasn't like really reciprocal. Like it wasn't like a two-way street. So are you just getting like surface answers on things? Literally. It was like the... It, the greatest way for me to explain it, it was it was like they had these secrets that they had found that they didn't want anyone else to know as opposed to coming from a place of like this sheer abundance. Now, upon reflection, it maybe it's just because they never actually knew that. Maybe they weren't actually doing that well, but they were trying to perceive that they were doing that well, which means they haven't blazed that path ahead of me. Do you think it was a confidence thing? Do you think maybe they weren't proud of the results they were producing? So in turn, they like, you know, they wear a Hugo Boss suit, but then- <laughs> Maybe exactly. they're not feeling well. Interesting. Yep. And so then what I actually did in my 20s was I said, I'm not going to get enough from sort of the, the group that I had. So there was a couple of things that I could do. I could go and find a better group. I could go and do all that kind of stuff. So I actually just moved overseas. And what I found was I lived in the Philippines like six years, seven years. 
man, I was talking to people who had call centers with like 150 people, uh, staff of 250 people, and they were an open book. I would literally would walk into their place of work and they would introduce me to like head of HR. They'd be like, yeah, his employment contracts, he's everything. And I'm just like, what? I'm like, what is this difference? And so then the network changed. And that's when my business fundamentally changed. The second I, I moved from a different network to another network, I was just like, wow, I need to continue to improve on, and work on top of this. Do you know what? Anyone who's had a good experience with improving their network or just networking in general, which would be me included, it's like once you've had a taste of how good it is to have a strong network, I don't think it's something you ever go back from. Never. Never. But there, there is, it's interesting, there's a little bit of a science around how do you create a network and how do you maintain a network? It's not like potluck. Like I think a challenge for a lot of business owners, it's they go to sort of meetups and they go to events and things like that and they meet people. They might not hit it off, <clears throat> like they might not sort of build that friendship and do all those kind of things. But there's a little bit of a science that sits behind it to say, hey, that person is one or two steps ahead of you. You might not add huge amounts of value that you think you might not add, right? Which is where I'm going to lead you into this question. Um, but there is this mechanism on how you can do this quite well in order to continue improving and improving on where you are now. So I'm actually going to hand it over to you, Joe. Like, how do you actually work on your network? Like, th this is something that a lot of people, I think, are listening to this saying, how can I progress this? Like, what, what are the, some of the things that I could do to actually improve my network? Yeah, I, I love this as a question. And I will say this is something I would consider a strong skill of mine. It's something I very much spend time on um, regularly. It's, uh, it, it is a muscle you have flexed so much to the point that I've asked you how you systemize it and do this. And it's it's almost like second nature to you. If you're not doing it, you're like getting this itch. You're going, oh man, I need to, <laughs> I need to like network with people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I, I would say the first thing uh, for anyone who wants to improve their network or have a good network is to work out the network you actually need. Mm -hmm. right? Define what a good network is. So like uh, in the example I'll use here, and I'm just going to say uh, something I'm not doing. So swimming, I don't swim. I have no intention of swimming, right? If I have a network of the best swimmers, Olympic athletes, you know, sure there's some crossover skills, don't get me wrong, but the reality is the likelihood of that network being of value to my life and goals is incredibly low. Yep. Could they be great people? Probably. And do you know what? Someone who can swim massive amounts, I'm curious of how they live even like, you know, personally. But for that being something I look at as being a, you know, crossover of value exchange, probably unlikely. And let's think about that from both ways. Like what value am I really going to add to them? They're not going to swim faster for knowing me if that's their goal. So wrong network. So I'll use an example here is like when I first started getting into, let's say, uh, property investing, I wanted to build a network of people that had kind of crossed that path because it was aligned to what I was doing. So first step for everyone, I would say, is like look at the areas of life that are important to you or the goals you have and whether it's health and fitness, parenting is one that's come up for me more mm. recently. And then establish the path you want to take. So maybe it's a, you know, a revenue goal in business or a number of properties or a net worth amount and then actively look at the people who are either on that path or have done that thing. Right, so establish what a good network would look like. Even if you haven't got the names of it yet, you need to know what the end goal looks like if you're ever going to build it. All right, now, the, the second one I look at here is like, and this is where I think it becomes more interesting, is like you've got to be able to get into the places that create that opportunity. So um, once upon a time, I used to um, love golf and I still love golf, right? But it's like if you want to meet the best golfers and you want to meet people who are good at golf, well, you want to hang out at the driving range where all the good golf golfers go. Yep. They're not some paddock in random suburbs. Like you want to go hang out at, uh, it's called MGA in Melbourne, which is like you will find the people who are really good at this and like that is your opportunity to be in proximity to the people who have done that thing. Mm. So bring that over to the business world for a second here. I'll, I'll take this in is like there are mastermind groups. There are meetups, there are events, you can pay uh, for mentors. Like it's actually quite easy to get in front of people in the business community and also the investing community. Like there's so many uh, mastermind groups for property or shares or, or investments or like there's a ton of that stuff out there. So I would say your step two is to invest in making sure you surround yourself with the people that are uh, on that path and have done that thing through paid avenues and the places they hang out. And you said really specifically, 
because I want to make sure this hits home, invest and paid avenues. Like I have been to a lot of meetups and business events, especially when I was younger coming out of university that were like free because I'm like, I'm a university student or I'm just starting out my business. Like I'm, I just need to go and see people, meet people like that will just create conversation. And, and it was less about an outcome. It was more about doing the action, right? So I was like, oh, I'm doing business. Everybody does business. It's all the same. At that start, at that point, I didn't understand that. Hey, running an agency is very different to running an e-commerce store. This is very different to running a fruit stand, right? Which means that everybody in those generic rooms all have solutions to what might seem the same problem. So niching, to your point, making sure you niche it down, but also making sure it's like a, it's like a pay to play, right? You don't want to get thrown into a group of other people who are not wanting to pay because they're starting their journey, right? It's like that's where the free groups are. So if you can upskill yourself or up, uh, sort of increase your network through investment so that the quality of the network that you're getting exposure to is a little bit higher, so you pay maybe an extra 50 bucks, 100 bucks to go to that specific driving range, for example, you will just meet better people. You will be able to step through. I still remember meeting some of the most amazing people in business class. <laughs> just like it just so happens that's where successful people are. Who would have thought? Yeah, and even to go a point deeper than that, which is, um, for example, you've got to be really careful with this and I'll express it from here. Like, let's say you're a business owner who uh, wants to build uh, a really high net worth. All right, so you've got like a double goal, right? You want to be successful in business and have a high net worth. You want to be very careful hanging out in business communities, let's say, where they just want a successful uh, business, but you know what? They want to blow all their money on status. It's all yep. about having the car, having the holiday, um, so you've got to be very cautious of how you filter the information you hang in and also the advice you take on. Like uh, I'll give you another one. I know a guy who was like, I want to have a, a $10 million business, but then he wasn't necessarily assessing the quality of the guy's life he was taking advice from who had the $10 million yep. a year business. I don't think he knows his, his kid's name. Yeah, <laughs> wow. So it's like you've got to really watch for those crossover of things as well. And like I, I am of the view that it's um, a good thing to get different perspectives but you've got to have your own filter when it comes to networking as well. Like you can't be blind into these things of like, well, I'm in this business owner community. I'm just going to take on their parenting advice. It's like maybe they're not great parents. Maybe you want to be networking with other parents to get ideas uh, around other things as well. So just be very, very mindful of like the cross-pollination that comes things. And just again, like I did this in the past, which is why I kind of put it out there. You might be idolizing someone for the result they have financially, not recognizing that it's like, I actually don't want my life to be like that. Mm. So just starting to be really cautious of there. So before we jump onto your next point, I'm curious, do you just like rock up like when you were looking to improve your golf or whatever this might be, cycling or any like agencies for business or otherwise, when you rock up to these events, like it might be a driving range, it might be a business event, do you just like look at a guy and just say, hey, nice swing, what do you do? Like, or hey, nice watch. Uh, what do you do? <laughs> like, how, like, is there like one little sort of tidbit for like cr creating these conversations? Because it's one thing to be there around people. It's another one to actually go and have the conversation. And I'll, I'll throw in my little tidbit after yours. Yeah, that's so funny. Um, I, I think we both have been to networking events or mastermind events and there's like people you just don't want to talk to. <laughs> have, you, have you ever had this experience where it's like there's someone in the room who's like, actively handing out business cards and like basically yes. just pitching. Was it you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, might, I might have printed 500 business cards when I first started and I might have handed them out. It might have been a numbers game. It was quantity, not quality. And then one guy said to me, and it was a business mentor at the time, he's just like, you know the people that you should talk to the most are the ones that don't say anything. <laughs> well, that's me. Like, no, yeah, no, just And so funnily enough, like I'm just, now I'm just like, cool. I'm like, that guy. <laughs> like, I'm just like, I'm looking out for the people. I'm like, what are you here for? And if, if they have like a purpose, I'm like, I want to talk to you. <laughs> but we go. But yes, that was me. At one point, I'll fall on my sword, Charlie. Thank you. Okay. So uh, I think, and this is why I think niching the events you go to or the, the stuff you do is really important here, right? So let, let's say you go to a business event and it's broad business. It's very, very hard to know why someone's there or what might be an interesting conversation, right? So it's like, it can be uh, challenging to do that. But let's say you're in a, um, a mastermind group and it's uh, agency owners, right? You very much already have insight to more than, and if you are an agency own, owner, I will say, you have insight to what's going on in these businesses. You understand what they're going through. 
like your ability to um, ask really good questions and be curious about another person's um, business is high. Mm. So when you're uh, in a new group with people, I would really, uh, let's say you go to a new thing and you're going in uh, to a group and there's the opportunity to network, maybe it's a mastermind event, or, well then you really want to be the one that's asking good questions and is actually curious and shows care for other people. Yep. Because you should be, of course, right? If you're going in there with the idea of like, and I've seen these people, you join a group and it's basically like, I'm just extracting from the room. I'm just like trying to take from everyone. Like people can feel that. Yep. And not only that, it's not a person anyone would want to do business with anyway. And I just think that you have to genuinely care. Like when I ask people questions or go into rooms or, or anything like that, like I want to know about what they're doing. I'm like, mm. well, how in this example is like, well, how are you running agency? I'm, I'm looking to uh, learn from you. Yep. Um, and even if you're at a slightly, let's say, lower revenue level, not lesser level, but just there, maybe you're doing things differently or things are working for you that I don't know about that I can incorporate into mine. So in all of these ones, right, I want you to imagine, right, I'm a, I'm a brand new property investor at this time. I go to a property mastermind. I'm in that room and I'm uh, going into that room purely from a place of just wanting to understand what everyone's getting up to and how they're thinking about it. And I'm sitting there, I'm asking them really good questions, I'm, um, I'm listening intently and what falls out is like I end up building good rapport with people Yep. because I'm not trying to go there and tell them how good I am. I'm there and building uh, things from there and like naturally from that, and this is a really, really important point, it's eventually conversations and things will get to a point where people want to know more about what I do. Yep. And when you can show not only that you're a normal human and care and all the rest of it, but you have value in the world as well, like you have things that might be valuable to them, things will peak up. And I think that's where uh, network and opportunity and relationships evolve from. So in the property example, we'll just use here quickly before I hand over the mic, I went into um, some property rooms, like with like I've, I've got no value to add in property, right? <laughs> I'm new at this. I'm a beginner at this stage. I just want to learn. But do you know what all the people in property or the I should say the business owners in the property space want? What? How do you make podcasts and media work? <laughs> I've got, I'm doing all this cool stuff. I would really love it if more people could see myself on social media. Like how do you make this? And I'm like, I, th I think when? I've got this one. <laughs> I, can, I can totally figure this out. Yeah, so for me, how I built a really good network in the property space is I went into that community and like I wanted to know everything they were doing and they wanted to know everything I was doing. Like I mm. had a very distinct value add and that's how I was able to build rapport and relationships with a lot of the bigger players in that space in Australia. So that's that's how it was done for me and I, I hopefully people can extract that it's like I, I get the idea of how this could work. Yeah, I've uh, you did touch on some really good points that I want to expand on because it, it aligns uh, heavily to myself. Asking good questions, like uh, open is a very easy, like walking up to, having the confidence to walk up to someone, like anyone listening to this, that you just need to work through that, right? Like it doesn't matter if you say nice watch, it doesn't matter if you say, what are you here for? Why? It, it doesn't matter. The value is like from the second question on, right? Which is to your point, Charlie, like the inquisitive questions, because the funny thing that I find is when I start asking more questions to other people, they start breaking down the problems that they're thinking through. And you can actually see what's on top of their mind based on the questions that you're asking. <clears throat> and so to outside of sort of asking the questions, I kind of get to a point of like, well, what's the biggest problem that you're actually trying to solve now? Like imagine you had a magic wand, which is the question I always ask. Like if you had a magic wand, what problem would you just like wish away? Right? And then they start talking about this problem. And so immediately I go back into my Teledex and go, do I know somebody that could potentially solve this problem, right? I might not know it there. I might not have it immediately in my network. But each time I talk to them, it's like, hey, did, have you sort of solved the problem? Like I was talking to this other guy. It might not be the perfect fit, but this is kind of where it's at. I might be able to start sending him podcasts I've listened to or anything like that, right? So actually understanding what they've got, but uh, actually understanding what problem they're trying to solve, I, I find is such a key rapport builder. Well, you just pulled a power move as well. I was, I was saving that for later, but I think that's a really good one. If you're known as a person who can connect people, right? So like if someone's looking to, oh, I need a, a graphic designer or, hey, I need someone who can do SEO or, hey, I'm looking for a mortgage broker, right? You start to become the avenue of people wanting to be connected and it's like that is a great way to build network. Really, really good. Se <laughs> yeah. Second one I'll throw in there as well though is like the other one is having value to add. Yeah. So in your case, Grant is like you're. Um, 
I think at problem solving, you're probably one of the best people I know. Undoubtedly, when I have complex problems, you are one of the people I go to. So knowing that you can add that value or marketing value, whatever it is, like now you can see that that's like uh, opportunity within the network. Yep. Right now you're a value to the network. You're not just there to take, you're able to contribute in a big way. Yeah, and, but, and I love that. And sorry for stealing your second point. Go for it. <laughs> uh, but the interesting thing, is and I'm going to make two points here. Is the first one is what I'm just going to call like natural selection, right? If I'm asking someone these questions, which are usually quite deep, like the amount of people, and you're probably the same, Charlie, that come to me and say, "Man, no one asked me these questions." Like, "Oh, that's a good question." Damn, that's a deep question. You know what? I haven't thought about that question. Is huge. Like most of the time, when I have a conversation with someone, they're like, "That is just a good question." That I haven't thought myself, which means now I'm getting their brain to start problem solving or thinking about something that they're like, I should have thought about that anyway. But if, but if the person isn't sort of reacting or responding or interacting with my level of deeper kind of questions, like, and I say deeper because I don't want surface level, like how's the weather, what's the weekend, like how's business and all that kind of stuff. Like I want, like, why are you thinking about that strategy? What made you come to that conclusion? Or how are you approaching that now? Is if they clam up and close up, then it's probably not the type of person that I want to network with. I want someone open because I'm open. I'm honest. I'm, I'm free, right? So you will naturally have this selection or if they don't have answers to it because they haven't thought about it because you will naturally select that, hey, this person isn't at that success level that's going to help you propel forwards because they can't answer the questions that you as uh, maybe sort of level one instead of a level five. If you're asking those questions, yeah, they can't help you get there. I feel like we're dancing around saying the things that you're not meant to say, but I'm going to say them, right? <laughs> Sometimes you're going to meet people who are lovely, like really nice people, uh, great ethics, all the rest of it, but it's just they're not the right person for your network. And like you have to, there's only so many spots on the team. And if you allow people that don't support that journey, then it's going to lessen the quality of your network, less of the opportunities that are going to come. And then ultimately, and this is the thing, it's going to lower your overall results because you will become who you spend time with. It's evident. They Everyone says it for a reason. It's because it's true. <laughs> exactly. And then the final point I will say before I let you sort of close this one out, Charlie, is the, the reason I asked the question of like, if you had a magic wand or what problem are you trying to solve is nine times out of 10, they will reciprocate that question. So when the conversation comes back around to me and I, I'm happy, I'm, like, I'm, I'm a rookie in this. I'm, I might at the stage, I might not be buying property or at the stage I might not have started my agency yet or at the stage I might not have done all these things and I'll be completely open and honest. Hey, like I'm starting, like this is what I'm doing. And they will usually ask the question of what problem are you trying to solve? If you had a magic wand, how would you go about it? And now I get to talk about my goal. Hey, look, I'm looking to try and get a million bucks worth of property. So I'm here, I'm absorbing, bam. They're going to go, hey, have you talked to that guy? Or, hey, have you read this? Or, hey, have you thought about this? Because it add, added so much to them just in that one conversation that they just go, yeah, cool, I'm happy. I'm happy to be the same guy back to you. But then it gets into a really good point around sort of the, the nurturing and the value and all these things that I'm just going to sort of let you continue riveting on your point before I get off. I'll get off my soapbox. I'll get off on my soapbox. I like your soapbox. <laughs> do, do you want to know my favorite question? Yeah, this, yeah, is yeah. My, this is my new one. Oh, it's not new. I've been using it for a while, but I just think this is a great one for me. I'm like... What's worked for you this year? Yes. I love I, that. Yeah. I think when someone answers that well, I, I, because then it's a direct insight that um, they get to share a win. Not only that, but it's like it gives me hints at what might be working for them. And I I went to a uh, mastermind event in Perth early this year and I asked everyone in the room that question. And I got some killer answers that were actually very, very helpful and developed better relationships. It was absolutely awesome. I enjoyed it a lot. Because everyone likes sharing their wins. Everyone likes sharing what they're doing. Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump into some things that um, are from this that I think are important to kind of add around it so people can uh, do more with this before we change topic, of course. All right, so the next thing is I noticed pretty inherently that like a lot of people want a strong network, but they are actually terrible at putting in the work to maintain one. <laughs> yep. So I take ultimate responsibility. So in my network, I don't care if people never message me. I don't care if people never email I'm going to be the one that stays on top of follow-ups, communicates, puts forward ideas, asks good questions. Like I think if you're the one continually showing up, that's really important. A mm. big mistake I see people make is like, well, oh, I had this great conversation. They said they'd call me. <laughs> well done. Well done. <laughs> Expect nothing. 
expect nothing. Like yep. be the leader in it. I, I don't know why this is true, but I just think people are inherently bad at follow-ups and those types of things because business is busy. Life is busy. Do salespeople in general, that's like the number one weakest point is like follow-ups. <laughs> yeah, so it. be the champion of that. I think yep. that's a, a really, really uh, important thing to do. Um, and then I'll say when it comes to like the, uh, let's say you develop a relationship with someone, you go, do you know what? We could probably do some business together or something like that. Be the one who leads and puts forward the deal as well in a way mm-hmm. that works for everyone. And um, if you're asking good questions, you should know what's important to this person. And if you can create deals that align to what's important to them, it's really easy to bring up, right? So I'll use an example here. Uh, Grant, I'd like I, um, I hear like you're trying to get towards uh, a million dollars property portfolio or 10 million or whatever it is. Do you know what? I'm trying to do the same thing. I can see an opportunity to do a development over here. Why don't we have a look at this? Yeah. So you can see that if it's, Im- I know it's important to him and it's important to me, we can make a win here. Hey Grant, I can see you doing this podcast. Like, how's it going? How about we, you know, I think you're putting a lot of effort in here. Maybe we should do a content JV and, and see if we can make our audience bigger. Or yep. how about I send an email to the list? Like you, you want to be really, really creative in being helpful for what they're trying to achieve. And in doing that, you can build some awesome relationships and also create some really epic value out of it. Yeah. And no matter what you have as well, there's always that that value. Like you, you always have the ability to add some kind of value, right? And if you're sitting there saying, I can't, yeah, work on that, right? Like I, I think that limiting belief of, but I'm starting out in this niche, I'm doing it. No, no, there's always that overlap. There is always that crossover. And One, and for- one final point, one final point. I know we're going to move on, but I will say one final point. Again, big mistake I noticed and something I did, I'm not going to sit here and say this is something that, um, uh, you know, I didn't come out of the womb knowing this stuff. This is something <laughs> as your goals change and you grow, so will the requirements of your network. Yep. I kept my network stagnant for a, a period of time. And don't get me wrong, really lovely people. But as I wanted to expand my net worth, as I wanted to become a parent, as I wanted to get up to different things, the people I needed around me to achieve that needed to change. Yeah. And it can be so hard and it was difficult to say, do you know what? This person's, um, as much as I really like them, I can't keep putting the time into this relationship because the opportunity cost on not putting that time into a new relationship is dragging down the results I want to achieve. So you got to, like, I evaluate my network probably every, I'll say every six months ish to a year when I'm kind of reevaluating my goals and what I'm trying to work on. And then it's just the who do I need to bring in this and repeat the process back around. Yeah. And I don't think that's a negative thing to sort of articulate as well. It's like what gets you here might not necessarily or most probably won't get you there. And so well, it's like, okay, well, the network, I'm, I might have changed niches, I might have changed industries, I might have changed my goal, I might have changed all of these things. It's like, okay, well, these people just haven't progressed in the same industry as much as I thought they might have or these people might not have bought as much property now as I thought they might have. Um, but you also open doors to more people and you just can't nurture 4,000 people. It's <laughs> so a time it's, thing. It's a yep. Now, final point on that is like, it's funny that as soon as I actively sought out people who had more than 10 properties and I started to hang around them, it's funny that that was the result that I produced in my life. Correct. So again, it's like you will become who you spend time with. And I hope people on this podcast are going, well, I will spend time with you guys so we have more friends, Grant. (laughs) (laughs) But but to be fair, go and join the Facebook group. Like I want friends. I want people to be around. I wholeheartedly agree with it. So I am going to change up speeds. I'm going to ask you another question, Charlie. Because I'm loving these very specific questions, by the way. Just straight at you. Is cost cutting the best way to grow profits? Yes. All right, cool. And that was the episode. No. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I can't resist the urge to just give you a very direct, like, jokey answer every time you ask me a direct question. Maybe and it's I something I need to work on. I um, can't re- resist the urge to ask you such yes, no questions as well. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I learned this um, strategy from a course we did not long ago. It really, it really hit home for me when I did this. Now, I must say I am quite diligent with my costs as it is. It's not like I had excessive costs in a business when I learned this, but it was really interesting equation that I hope people take from this. If you're a business owner and um, you save $1,000, so maybe you go through your uh, costs and you go, do you know what? I can take $1,000 out of my running costs. You directly take that $1,000 to profit. Like a dollar save is a dollar earned. Now, on the other hand of things, if you earn an extra $1,000, right? so you grow your revenue by 1000 
by the, uh, if you have, let's say, I'm going to use, kind of use a 50% margin to make the maths easy. You actually have to earn $2,000 to uh, take out the $1,000 of profit. So you can see that in the example, and that's on a 50% margin, a lot of business owners don't have a 50% margin, nope. is that if you directly uh, save a dollar, you earn a dollar, but when you grow revenue, you have to grow substantially more revenue to do both uh, to create that same effect. And when I really understood that, I'm like, right, this is very interesting. And I'm not saying you don't need to do both, but you definitely need to be diligent to produce a really great result here. Yeah, I am. Um, I it, it is the easiest thing when you understand it to just go, oh, it actually doesn't take me that long to remove some kind of costs, right? Because it's like, okay, well now similar to how I would invest time into sales and marketing to generate more I just put a similar, or oh, I'm not going to put the same amount of time, but I just redirect some attention and say, well, how do I decrease my costs? The, the mechanics that sit behind it is is no different, but just understanding to your point, that equation of going, holy smokes, I need to sell in most businesses scenarios four thousand dollars in order to make one thousand. You know what? Let's be honest. It's probably six thousand dollars to make one thousand dollars in a lot of businesses, uh, versus just going, well, how can I remove one thousand dollars? worth of expenses every single month. Like it, that disparate view, like just imagine the leads you have to generate, the sales you have to generate, the work you have to do to nurture them and then deliver the service and do all that kind of stuff versus just going, I'm going to have a very difficult conversation with one person. I'm going to have a very difficult conversation with one supplier. Like it's it's almost like this path is so much easier <laughs> to run um, outside of just going, well, just more is more. Completely. Can, can I, there is an art to cost cutting though and I would love to go into that a little bit and just describe like um, good cost cutting versus bad cost cutting. All right, I, I'll, I'll use the example of a computer here, right? If you have uh, a computer and let's say you have the brand new Mac and it costs you $5,000 for this laptop and you can do the exact same job on a uh, $2,000 Mac laptop, right? If you're going to cut that cost down $3,000, and there's no difference in output, that's good cost cutting yep. because you're actually being more efficient. If you uh, just cut your marketing budget and it actually ends up producing less leads and degrading the business, you're actually making it smaller, that is, I'm just going to call it bad cost cutting. Yep. There might be reasons to do it, but I think in the idea we're talking about here is we're saying, you know, what costs can I cut to be more efficient with my uh, capital? And I think one of the things I've really seen at times and particularly more recently with business owners as the economic environment has changed is they cut costs in the wrong area, not recognizing that, hey, I've got to, maybe I need to invest in my business to get a better team member so that I can actually thrive in this next fire. You might need to spend more money in areas. Like there may be areas of your business you don't want to cut. Yep. Um, so you've got to be very, very careful with how you play this. And you made an excellent one in um, – in what we do with the media company, do you want to uh, talk into like how you were able to kind of like, you did a really good roll up of our software stack. I thought it was quite impressive recently. Yeah. So <laughs> problem solving, something I, I thoroughly enjoyed. So when we, <clears throat> we were looking through all of our financials, uh, we split out all of our software costs and we actually found that because we've got video editors, um, audio editors, like uh, content writers, graphic designers, um, project managers, etc. You kind of mentioned the works. Uh, they all kind of need bespoke tools. However, when you look at bespoke tools, usually, usually a subject matter expert will only use like 20% of them. I've even seen people use like 5% of these tools. So these tools have huge amounts of breadth. So like we were using a video review tool called Frame.io, huge amounts of capabilities, like people at Pixar and stuff like that use them. We were using like this tiny fraction <laughs> of this tool. And so we, we were spending thousands on this thing. And we went, okay, cool. We also had project managers that were doing a lot of project management, et cetera. And I'm like, well, how do we get these reviews that we're doing on the videos and the tasks that the project managers create for the video editors to edit and just kind of merge it in together? And so we ended up finding ClickUp, which has actually got a video review tool in the same system, as well as some other tools that we're able to get rid of and merge it into one. So not only... Dude, we kind of changed like three subscriptions into one subscription. We we significantly reduced our cost base whilst actually giving the team the same 
amount of functionality they needed. And so it actually worked out to be a significant improvement, especially the amount that we were spending on uh, software, et cetera. Now, every single, probably to your point, six months, I just sit down and I just look at our tools and just say, is there some kind of new innovation that we could replace it with uh, instead of just like resting on our laurels? Um, or even from just our admin costs, is there anything else that we can do just so that we can kind of drive that profitability instead of just having this kind of stagnant software there or this ghost software there just not doing anything that no one really is really maximizing? Yeah, I think that's massive. Software is a great one. I think every business owner listening to this one could evaluate the software they use because you get complacent, right? It's that um, just sitting there and say, oh, we've always used this. And but that's the, I think that is the problem that a lot of people face. I was talking to a, a lovely lady who's the CEO of an organization that does very well. And we were looking at numbers and it was like, oh, that's always been like that. Yeah, no, I get that. <laughs> but why? <laughs> why is that so high? Oh, well, I just, I'd never looked under the cover of that before because everyone just said like, that's how, that's the norm. It's just, that's how it is. And so we've just started like looking under the cover of these different expenses and going, can we optimize any of these things? Because anything that we can optimize, and you're talking like $10,000, $20,000 a month expenses here. If we can reduce some of that, that's $5,000 of profit. That's $10,000 of profit every single month recurring forever. And I'm just like, so don't just rest and just say, oh, we've always done it like that. No, no, no. Look at everything. And don't do it. Don't do it weekly. Like time box it, do it monthly or quarterly or every six months, et cetera. Like this shouldn't be a nickel and dime scenario. This should just turn into like that cadence of, okay, what are we spending on? How are we going to optimize it? I actually review this every month. Do you want to know how yeah. I review it? <laughs> oh. All right. So I, I, um, I'm a really big fan of uh, this metric called ROE, return on equity. Yep. Right? And the way I think about it is every month in, in business, you've got uh, running costs. You've got your expenses to run your business. And let's just pretend it's a hundred grand. Okay, so it costs you $100,000 every month to run your business and then you generate revenue from that. So maybe you generate 200 grand of revenue, which would give you a 50% margin in this example. Now, let's say next month you produce uh, 220 grand of revenue, right? but you you keep your expenses the same, right? So you're still spending 100 grand, but you've been able to generate 20% more revenue. That's good expense management. That means right. your expenses, are, your expense is staying the same and you're actually producing more. But if it goes the other way, so maybe the month after, you still got your 100 grand in costs, but you only produce 150 grand in revenue. Well, that is return on equity. So the return you're getting on spending your capital in your business is decreasing. Now, yep. uh, for a lot of people, I would really encourage they look at it month on month because maybe you're adding things into your business and it's not turning into more revenue. And this is where bloat comes from. This is where people get really, really bloated as a business. So I look at it and say that ROE metric is just such a good way to identify if you're becoming more or less efficient with the money you're spending and if you should be evaluating your costs more granularly. And then once you've kind of established that, like maybe you get to it and go, cool, I can see I'm getting bloated, but I don't actually know what to cut. Like, well, how, how do I work out what to look through? Software is the standout one, I think is a really good one you kind of like pointed out first. But then um, secondary to that, and I know we've already spoken about this earlier in the episode, this is where I love to do the networking thing and going, hey, what are you using to do this? How Mm. much is it costing you to deliver that? How much are you paying staff to do these areas so you can evaluate and go, well, he's only paying this to do that and I'm actually heavy here. And now you can start to identify the areas where you would make change. Uh, Maybe you're doing a role onshore in Australia where people have found a way to do it offshore. Maybe you're using an expensive tool. Maybe you've got an expensive um, team member. Um, And I really want to highlight this one as well, though. Um, The areas I think that you've got to be very, very careful with cost cutting, team and marketing. Yep. Because if you get those ones wrong, the impacts of like being able to produce new revenue or grow revenue decrease massively. Yeah. So be very, very careful. And I'm even biased. I would much prefer to have good team. I think trying to have cheap team never leads to good things. I've, I've funnily enough, I was literally looking through a P- profit and loss statement. I won't say PL, PL, uh, a balance sheet uh, with someone like last night. And I was looking at all of the expenses and the one that I'm like, okay, we can reduce some of these expenses. But the one that you might actually want to dial up was like, the delivery team expense. I'm like, that's just way too cheap. Like you, you, you are probably decreasing the amount of like sort of new contracts and stuff you can get because you are underspending on your team, which means your customers might not be getting the greatest experience. And so then it get, it does get to that point of an equal equilibrium. 
of going, no, 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 you've cut this way too far and you're seeing it in a sort of other areas. Um, but I will sort of add another one on top as well is like I know that we have had sort of team members that, and it doesn't sound the greatest when I say it out loud, but that we have been able to sort of uh, displace with software where it's like, okay, well, we can just collaborate better on that, which means that this role doesn't need to exist anymore. And so actually looking at not just a, how do I improve this or how do I eradicate something? It's how, what's the substitute? What are other people doing? Can Do we need to do it in-house or can I go and get someone else to do it? Like, can I get an agency to do that? Can I, or am I using an agency and I can bring it in-house, right? So it's always like thinking outside the box, outside of just cut, 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 cut. It's yeah. substitute and replace. I had completely forgotten that. That's a great one. Sometimes you can actually bring something in house or take it out of house for a significant advantage. Yep. Better outputs, better like, increased improvements or even decreased costs. Like there's so much to it. So much to it. Uh, huge. I love this episode, Charlie. <laughs> like, I could just keep going bloody for ages. But I... I am. Um, I do. Uh, I do have to wrap this one up, unfortunately. But for everyone who's tuning in, uh, be on the listen for the next episode. We've actually got the killer guest coming on, so I'm not. I'm not even going to mention who it is. So just be on the lookout for it. And don't forget, if you do want to submit your questions and get us to answer them, just reply to Charlie's email. Just hit reply. Spam him. Send him an email every day, every day for four months. Do it because I think it would be hilarious. Or you can actually head over to the Facebook group, uh, Full Stack, a business owner community. Messages over there. We'll pull it, pick up your questions and actually answer them here. And if you did enjoy the episode, be sure to subscribe, share it with someone else that might be going through the same journey or needs to hear this kind of type of information. And I just want to say thank you again for joining us. And we look forward to catching you on the next episode of Full Stack Business Owner.